Hello, everyone. I'm Miao Wang, engineer manager at Adobe. Today, with my colleague Jun Ma, we will present our work on enforcing GDPR and CCPA in very large data sets with Apache Spark. Uh, here is our talk agenda. I will cover the background, platform data management architectures, and the challenges we are facing on handling GDPR and CCPA in our data lake. Then Jun will present our solution with Bloom filter, including design concerns, performance evaluation, trade-offs, and future work. So background. In recent years, data privacy becomes more and more important for both end users and data service providers. Therefore, there are a few regulations have been enforced in the field. For example, general data protection regulation. It is a regulation in European Union and European economic areas, which is effective from May 2018. Similarly, California enforces California Consumer Privacy Act, CCPA, effective from January 1st, 2020. All the regulations guarantee the user can access and erase their data stored by data uh, service providers. A violation of such regulations not only hurts the reputation of the business, but, um, but it implies big penalty to the business. From the backend engineering perspective, the core component of handling such regulations is the same. That is locating users' records given users' identity information. So before uh, introducing details of how we handle GDPR and CCPA in our data platform, I would like to work through the data flow of Adobe Experience Platform. As a data platform, we provide different ways of bringing customer data into data lake. Uh, like REST API, connectors, uh, streaming services. While data are being ingested into data lake, we launch computer jobs to do data validation, data conversion, and read clean data into data lake. We're also providing data egress service, including REST API SDK to consumers, uh, like uh, data engineers, data scientists, uh, customers, and third parties. Uh, within uh, data lake, we run a data management service which handles GDPR and CCPA requests. Now let's take a closer look on the architecture of a data management service. So in general, there are two types of requests of GDPR and CCPA. The first type is called access. It means data user wants to access its data uh, stored up at our data lake. The second type is called delete. It means the user wants to delete his or her data stored by our, uh, by our data lake. User submit a request to uh, to Adobe uh, Private Service, which uh, which does uh, authorization and fil uh, and filtering the request and submit the request to to data management service. Uh, data management service will extract the user identity information and submit jobs to schedule service, which launches and monitors computer jobs. The computer job does the heavy lifting work. Uh, uh, which, uh, which are computer jobs uh, of scanning data with identity columns as keys. If it is a, a delete request, we will delete the matched records in data lake. If it is an access request, we will write the matched records to an egress storage, for example, Azure storage, and notify user to download this record through our customer notification pipeline. Uh, there are three challenges of handling CDPA and GDPR in our data platform. That is data size, cost, and scalability. Uh, we are seeing tens of thousands of requests per customer per hour in our production. In the next two slides, I will present the uh, data size and the cost uh, on handling these requests. Uh, this table shows how we classify our data lake accounts according the account uh, data size and the number of files in that account. For example, a small storage account has less than one terabyte data with fewer than one million files and folders, while an extra large account uh, has 50 to 400 terabytes data with 50 to 100 million files and folders. A customer may have multiple data lake accounts for different business purposes. 
uh, this figure shows the compute cost of uh, one scan of a different data size with different uh, uh, data size. Uh, based on our measurement, scanning one terabyte data cost $37. Scanning 10 terabyte data cost $278. Based on our Cox model projection, uh, one scan of one terabyte data uh, will cost uh, more than $15,000. They have more details uh, documented in a published uh, uh, blog below. You can refer it for details. So let's see what's the problem. So the problem of locating a customer record based on user identity, it's like finding a needle in a haystack. There are too many unnecessary scans. Taking all this manager data set as an example, this data set contains 700 terabytes data, which includes 75 billion users. So the average user record size is 20 kilobytes. So therefore, finding a user with ID information is equivalent to finding 20 kilobytes data into 700 terabytes data. So uh, one intuition is to apply some data skipping technology to avoid such unnecessary scans. Uh, on this figure, we show how uh, we store data in our data lake. For each data site, uh, it is stored in our data lake based on some partition strategy. In this example, it stores based on year, month, day, and a, a, a batch ID. Batch ID is the internal transaction ID. Since the user information usually spans in multiple columns of data, therefore it makes the bracketing and the stats mean max won't work well for this skipping. For each column, it has a very large number of distinct values, which means that the column has a high cardinality, which makes some encoding scheme like this dictionary encoding not working well with this skipping. So our solution is using Bloom filter, which is a probabilistic data structure to test whether an element is a member of a site. Bloom filter has a nice property that has zero false negative. Therefore, if a Bloom filter says that one ID is not contained in your file, uh, it is safe, we can uh, skip the whole file. There are two key parameters to, de to determine the Bloom filter size and accuracy. So the first one is the number of distinct values, or NDV in short. The second one is false positive probability, or if FB in short. So the algorithm itself is not super complex to implement, and there are multiple implementations in the open source world. However, to integrate uh, uh, the Bloom filter in production and how to apply Bloom filter properly is still a challenging task. It is because we have to solve three categories of problems. First, uh, when, how we build a Bloom filter. Second, how can we maintain Bloom filter while we're updating uh, the, the data lake? The third, how to apply Bloom, Bloom filter with Apache Spark. Uh, I will handle the rest of presentation to Jun and let her present our solution uh, using Bloom filter. Thanks, Miao. Um, now uh, we, I will um, go over the design concerns that we had one by one. The first question is that when we should build the, the Bloom filters. The decision was uh, to build the Bloom filter at the ingestion time. Um, we get the data from the producer. Once uh, the data is landed to data lake, there will be a Spark job kicked off to load the data, do some validation and conversion, and write the result back to another directory in data lake. And the, the output of the Spark job contains two parts. One is the data files, and two is the Bloom filters. Originally, we thought about building Bloom filters after ingestion, but we decided to go with the current approach because of several reasons. Firstly, um, it uh, will add less overhead overall. Um, with this approach, we can only scan the data once and generate the Bloom filters and data files at the same time. There is no need for an extra time of scan. Secondly, the overall operational cost is low. We have an existing Spark job which can plug in the, the Bloom filter related logic. Um, but if we want to build Bloom filter after ingestion time, we have to have a separate Spark job specifically for the Bloom filter, as well as uh, the logic to decide when to schedule the, that Spark job. The, another advantage is that this approach will not introduce any delay 
as soon as the data file is available, we can have, we can, we know for sure the Bloom filters will also be available. We don't have to worry about the case where some of the files um, may have Bloom filter and some others don't. There's one disadvantage of this approach. It will add more overhead and failure point to the ingestion pro process. We also measured the overhead through the test, which will be shared a bit later. The second question is that at which level we should build the Bloom filter. As Mia already mentioned, our data is stored as parquet in the data lake and they're partitioned by some uh, partitioning strategy. The Bloom filter is, this, uh, is built on the file level because uh, we all know Parquet is not in, uh, in, is immutable. As long as uh, the file gets generated, we nobody will be able to um, update the, the Parquet file. So if we build the Bloom filter um, by uh, on the file level, then we don't have to worry about uh, maintain the Bloom filters. There, we don't need to um, make any uh, delete any elements once uh, the Bloom filter gets deleted. Uh, sorry, yeah, once the element gets deleted. Um, there's uh, it's just uh, when the data file will be gets will need to be deleted at some point, we have to make sure the Bloom filter files can be deleted at the same time. Um, the Bloom filter metadata is stored as a separate um, metadata folder and they're partitioned in the same way as the data files. We are building one Bloom filter per data file per column. So the total number of the Bloom filter files will be equal to the, the total number of data files multiplied by the number of columns with Bloom filter enabled. One problem that might be introduced with this, this approach is that logically the Bloom filter size will be much smaller than the original data file. So um, we're, if we are building multiple Bloom filters for the same data file, then we are creating a lot of uh, small files in the, in the system. To mitigate this problem, we are considering to combine the different Bloom filters for the same file into one so that we can reduce the number of small files. Uh, one major use case we have for GDPR is to search identity on map type column. This is a, a kind of complicated uh, structure with a map on the top level column. And the key, the value of the map is an array. Within the array, each element is a struct and the identity is stored as a string in the struct. Since we want Bloom filter to help with all the GDPR use cases and how have to improve uh, performance, we have to make sure Bloom filter can be built on this complicated column. The way we solve this problem is to consider the key and the value as two separate columns, so that we can flat all the values in the uh, all the IDs in the value array and insert uh, everything all the, all of them to the big um, Bloom filter and generate one Bloom filter for the entire map, in, ir irrespective of uh, which key the ID belongs to. Another important part is to decide what is the uh, um, size to allocate to the Bloom filter. The size of Bloom filter is determined by two factors, the FPP, false positive probability, and NDV, the number of distinct values. Once those two variables are decided, we can use a formula to calculate what is the optimal size of Bloom filter. In order to decide the number of distinct values, we have to look at the um, data pattern in our production. So we're trying to make sure uh, all the files we generate in production is around one gigabyte. So once the file size is decided, we can use the number of rows in each file to estimate the number of distinct values. We're using 2.1 million as a default value. Now, FTP is the only variable left to determine what is the size to, for the Bloom filter. And here's a table to show the different size Bloom filter size according to the different value for FPP we select. For the test we're running um, for estimation and performance evaluation, we're using 0 0.01 as a default value. 
Now let's look at how the Bloom filter is integrated with the Spark job. The Bloom filter logic is implemented in Apache Iceberg. It's an open source lightweight table format to manage the table metadata. It's also integrated with Spark. In the red path, users have to predefine what are the ID columns that they want to enable Bloom filter. And the Bloom filter com configuration is stored in the table schema. There is an API provided to config the Bloom filter setup for each um, column. Um, the user should provide the column name, FTP and AD NDV in order to set up the column correctly. Once the table schema is decided, people can use the data frame API to write the data into the table and specify the table format as iceberg so that the Bloom filters and data files can be generated at the same time. On the read path, again, we need to make use of the data frame API and to load the table as iceberg format. In order to tell iceberg to make use of Bloom filter to file skipping, we have to pass the Bloom filter query to the iceberg reader using the Spark option. Um, in the Spark option, we should provide what is a column we want to search on and what is a value we are interested in so that Bloomfield uh, Iceberg in the background, it can automatically skip most of the files that don't contain this value. We evaluated performance on a 1.5 terabyte dataset. This is a one month customer invent dataset and we obfuscated the entire dataset to make sure it's anonymous. In total, it has uh, more than 700 files. And on average, each file is about 833 megabytes. We're building Bloom filter on one ID column. The overhead to build Bloom filter at ingestion time is about 1.1% compared with the, the um, ingestion cost before without Bloom filter. Similarly, the storage overhead also increased by 1% in order to store the Bloom filter related metadata. Note that here we are um, estimating based on one column enabled with Bloom filter enabled. If uh, for the data set, there are multiple columns we want to build Bloom filter, then the overhead will increase accordingly. Before we look at the performance in the read site, we want to spend some time to understand the ID distribution. It is quite important because we want to make sure the ID is partially distributed in the, in the data set so that there is enough space for Bloom filter to optimize. Imagine if there are a lot of IDs, they appear in our, almost every single file, then Bloom filter cannot do anything in this situation because there won't be any file that can be skipped. So it turns out that the data that we have in production that do have a very parse dis, um, distributed ID. For the one we're using for, this, for the test, 99% of the IDs appear in less than 31 files compared with the total number of the file, um, which is more than 1700. This is less than 2%. So we do have enough space for Bloom filter to do file scaping. We also confirmed this pattern with a much larger data set. Um, this one has the six months customer event data set and uh, the ID distribution is similar. 99% of the IDs appear in less than nine files for the large data set. So we picked a couple of uh, IDs that appear in different number of uh, files and run the GDPR query on top of them. We also uh, run the Spark job without Bloom filter to get a baseline of, um, of cost. It turns out Bloom filter is very helpful in terms of uh, cost saving. We, uh, for example, for the ID that appears in 31 files, we can, achieve, we can save, save uh, more than 90% of the cost. And this case can already cover 99% of the IDs. So to conclude, Bloom filter is very helpful 
in to handle the GDPR and CCPA use case. It can allow us to process the data sets much faster. Um, since a lot of files can be skipped, it will enable us to support much larger data sets than before. Also, the cost is greatly reduced. Now we're working on productize the Bloom filter work, and there are a couple of things uh, still going on. First one is that we're trying to combine the Bloom filters for the same data file into one and mitigate the small file problem. Also, uh, currently the process to load Bloom filters is in the driver. We want to move it to the extruders so that the process can be parallelized. Another thing is that we're trying to extend the Bloom filter use case from GDPR to general query. Because, uh, because any column that is sparse and uh, is frequently used for in the query can have Bloom filter enabled and sp speed up the queries. Here are uh, the address of uh, Miao and myself. Feel free to reach out to us if you have any questions or thoughts. Thanks. Now we can take some questions. 